Sharmila, go public with that, with the viewing. Yeah. Sharanda, you may begin. A very good evening to one and all present here. I'm Saranya Bose, and I welcome you all to the inaugural event of the English Lyceum. Firstly, I would like to extend a note of thank you to all my team members for their immense hard work and support, and the audience for becoming a part of this event and gracing it with their presence. We have with us our esteemed speaker, Dr. Diana J. Fox, who I shall introduce a little later. I would now like to invite Dr. Saurav Banerjee to introduce the forum. Dr. Saurav Banerjee is an associate professor and head of the Department of English of a government-sponsored college affiliated to the University of Calcutta, India. He has more than 20 years of teaching experience and is an education ambassador of the International Organization of, education, of Ed Educators and Researchers, Incorporated, Philippines. The managing editor of Tell Me Your Story, international projects, among other things. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Sharanya. And uh, a very warm welcome to Diana and all our viewers, live and those who will catch up later. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, we are elated to officially begin the journey of the English Lyceum today with its inaugural session. And uh, we are honored that it will be delivered by none other than Professor Diana J. Fox, a globally renowned academic stalwart and a dear friend. The English Lyceum is the brainchild of a few academician friends who came together and uh, gave shape of their vision of a world community of students, academicians, teachers, and those interested in vibrant communication of and about literature. It is a non-profitable organization devoted to literature and an enthusiast forum with the mission of expanding and celebrating the essence of literature, culture, and allied things. Now, as to the name of our forum, though Shakespeare had said, and I quote, what's in a name that which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet, unquote, yet, Rabindranath Tagore had opined, and I quote again, Shahitya jakhon namkorane shomoyashe, takhon didhai pori, unquote, meaning that he felt a bit hesitant when it came to naming a literature. That is because names are not random, but become markers, having their own connotations and denotations, and even become symbols and myths at times. So while christening our forum, if I may use the term, uh, we wanted it to be such that it would reflect our ideals and aspirations. And we were suddenly reminded of Aristotle's Lyceum established just outside the city boundary of Athens. While Alexander was conquering uh, Asia, Aristotle, who was then 50 years old, built a substantial library and gathered around him a group of brilliant research students called Peripatetics from the name of the cloister Peripatetos in which they walked and held their discussions. The Lyceum was not a private club like the academy, and many of the lectures uh, there were open to the general public and given free of charge. Working on similar principles and based on our vision, we would celebrate unity, but would also welcome diverse views. We would invite people to join our forum and encourage camaraderie of our members and let words be our net that will tie us all together. Uh, we would encourage our members to share their areas of interest so that the forum can forge its course of action about its programs in terms of discussions, talks, and write-ups that would make the forum complete. Affirming to the unity of purpose, the forum will also promote mutual activities, and the forum will remain committed to building a community of like-minded people in love with and wanting to explore, discuss, and share views on literature. And though primarily committed to English language literature, the forum will be inclusive 
to literature of all languages in translation in english thus the name the english lyceum to conclude our forum recognizes the power of words its ability to transform empower and translate thoughts dreams and much more and thus we begin our journey today with an anthropologist a decolonial feminist anthropologist at that and not a literary scholar per se who will talk about folkloric studies from an ethnographic perspective and share how stories or narratives are embedded in all genres of lore material customary ritual and verbal lore so soliciting the blessings and the best wishes of all we embark on our humble journey now many of you have already connected with us and i'm optimistic that many others will join us in our journey so thanks to all of you and over to you sharanya thank you sir our topic for today is stories are everywhere an anthropological lens into folkloric analysis i would now like to introduce our esteemed speaker for today dr diana j fox dr J diana j fox is a professor of anthropology at bridgewater state university and is currently on leave while she serves as university director at the institute for gender and development studies at the regional headquarters of the university of the west indies in jamaica as a feminist decolonial and applied anthropologist scholar activist and documentary film producer her work has focused on the anglophone caribbean particularly jamaica and trinidad and tobago nepal and japan where she researches issues of gender and sexual diversity women's social movement activism for ecological sustainability women's human rights transnational feminisms and gendered nature of social movements for liberatory change she serves on a number of boards and committees including the sexualities working group of the caribbean studies association the international advisory board of the fondus amandus community reforestation project in the in the trinidad and tobago the board of friends of adwan association of dalit women advancement nepal and is the founder and editor of the open access online journal of international women studies i shall now share my screen and i request dr diana fox to formally inaugurate the website and begin today's session greetings everyone it is such an honor and pleasure to be here let us begin the session i would like to thank dr banerji and the team for inviting me to this inaugural lecture it as i said such an honor i do have a powerpoint and we've had a few little technical difficulties so i'm speaking to you from my phone and Saranya is going to share my slides and so you'll hear me say next slide as she goes forward. So let's let's begin. If you could share the first slide please. I I welcome your Ma thoughts and Ma'am uh yes. Ma'am before that uh if I would request you to please uh launch our website. Okay. um uh i other than stating that the website is now launched is there any other detail you would like me to share thank thank you ma'am uh you may now begin with today's session wonderful thank you very much could you please go back to the previous slide the title slide the title of my talk there you go is stories are everywhere an anthropological lens into folklore analysis and for those of you who may not be aware anthropology is a four subfield discipline it contains biological anthropology and archaeology which are both sciences life sciences and geological sciences included it also includes uh cultural anthropology and i am trained in cultural anthropology as well as the other subfields and linguistic anthropology therefore anthropology embraces the social sciences the life sciences and the humanities and it is through this particular lens of humanities since this is a literary forum that i will be discussing folklore today 
Although it is interesting to note that in the ancient past, in deep time, archeological remains also indicate that stories are part of being human. So let's now move on to the next slide and I'll share the outline of my talk today. I'm going to be talking about the anthropological categories and characteristics of folklore briefly, and then move somewhat quickly through the first four theoretical frameworks of functional functionalism, which is, as I note, dated, but still helpful in folkloric studies. Structure theory, which is a little bit different from structuralism. Psychoanalysis, psychology, and then the areas of my specialty, feminism, gender analysis, queer folkloristics, and decoloniality. And it's important to point out from the onset that while academics like to identify specific theories and often associate themselves with specific theories, they are interactive and overlapping. And I hope that by the end of the presentation, you'll see how this is the case. Then I will share a few ethnographic examples from my field work in Nepal and in the Caribbean, in especially Jamaica, in order to give you some opportunity to see how these theoretical frameworks can be applied to interpreting the meaning of folklore. Next slide, please. So if you see on the top, I've separated folk and lore with an asterisk, and that is just to bring your attention to the fact that the word folklore comes from the German word Volk, and Volk means people. Folklore and lore means stories. So folklore generally refers to stories of the people, of everyday people. And in anthropology, we make a distinction between informal culture, which is another word for folklore, versus formal culture. Culture, as you may know, refers to all the systems of meanings, the values, norms, practices, symbol systems that are integrated into a cultural system, which is always emergent, always challenged, um, and occurs at these multiple levels of both informal everyday life and, of course, the authoritative realm of institutions such as the law, for instance, or even the institution of the university. So even though I'm going to be talking about folklore here, for instance, I am not producing folklore here. This is not an environment in which folklore is produced. Folklore is passed down by word of mouth, by observation, by imitation, in the very same ways that everyday culture is passed down to children throughout the life cycle in a process that anthropologists refer to as enculturation and sociologists refer to as socialization. So within the realm of informal culture, we find these four genres that Dr. Banerjee already mentioned, verbal lore, which refers to stories, narratives, jokes, prayers, chants, all kinds of expressions of verbal behavior that are passed down in this fashion. Narrative lore or stories is a particular genre, but even when we're telling jokes, even when we're making greetings to one another, even when we're saying prayers or chants or singing lullabies or ballads, uh, all of those are examples of verbal lore, we're also telling stories. They may be part of larger stories, but they are stories nonetheless. Material lore comes in two forms, permanent and ephemeral. Now, we know that nothing is permanent, but here what is crucial is the intention of permanence. So human beings create objects through knowledge passed down, again, through these processes of observation, everyday life, word of mouth in the informal realm, they produce objects that we hope last in the world. So, for example, um, certain artifacts that are passed down 
through generations, through families, family heirlooms, for instance. Um, those are examples of permanent material lore. Gravestones are another example, jewelry, um, linens, perhaps shawls, items of import that pass down a history, and here, or herstory, we have the word story there, of family and community life. Ephemeral lore is lore that is not sustained. It is lore that is intended to be destroyed. And this means, for example, that it is created um, with deep meaning nonetheless, but people, the folk who create it, know it will not last. A quick example might be um, a beautiful meal that takes hours to create, days perhaps to organize, and then it is devoured within a short period of time. Mandalas, for example, sand mandalas that the monks of Tibet create are an example of ephemeral material lore. And all things that are ephemeral have a reason for being ephemeral. Of course, the mandalas are ephemeral because the idea is that as soon as they are completed, the universe has changed. And so the mandala must change as well. The next genre of lore is customary lore, and this refers to behavior, habitual behavior, behavior that is expected, that is normative, and that is regularized in everyday life. The last genre is ritual, which is the most complex genre of lore. And ritual has many different forms. There's rites of passage, for example, that transport people from one stage of life to the next. Um, in the movement across our lifespan, there are rites, uh, that those are rites of passage. There are rites of initiation. There are all kinds of rites that are inclusive of all of the other forms of lore. Now, again, just like theory, genres of lore uh, are separated so that they can be analyzed and understood and taught, but they are interactive. When we prepare a ritual meal, for example, we are including ephemeral and permanent material items. We are using items to create the meal, but those items may be edible or they may be pots and pans and, and silverware and other things that are passed down. We're also using verbal lore, unless there is a vow of silence that is taken. Verbal lore is the process of talking and telling stories about the meal. Many ritual meals, for instance, have symbolic items. And so those symbolic items are also customary. There may be words that are repeated during a ritual. So that's those, all those forms of lore are coming together in the ritual process. In addition, we, we look at the characteristics of lore. All lore is tradition. That means it is expected, normative, passed down, and repeated behavior. However, we have to dissolve ourselves of the view that traditions are always ancient. Human beings are always creating traditions. Traditions are not static. They are at the same time uh, continuous. They repeat some elements so that they are recognized as part of a longstanding tradition or a relatively newly created one, but they also are dynamic. So the, 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 the characteristics of continuity and dynamism are part of traditions. All lore is also performed. And because folklore is informal, when we say that lore is performed, we don't mean that this is necessarily on a stage in a formal setting, but it is the action, the practice of enacting the folklore in everyday life. And you know that members of your folk group understand the performance when they respond in appropriate ways. So almost every culture, for example, has verbal lore for when somebody sneezes. Um, the, the, the saying, bless you, for example, in, in English, goes back to a long tradition of protecting persons from evil spirits entering into their bodies when they sneeze. And so the bless you is the response to the sneeze 
And then the thank you is the response to the performance of saying bless you. Bless you is a performance. Now notice that those words, those simple words of bless you are part of a larger story that I just told about people fearing that evil spirits will enter their body when they sneeze. And this is encased even within a broader story about understandings of sickness and well-being that are passed down and understood. Even when times change, even with the biomedical understanding of disease or the germ theory of disease, persons still say bless you as a form of courtesy, though few people still believe that evil spirits enter the body. So all lore is tradition, it's performed, and it is also a text. And in this sense, it's connected to this literary analysis. A text refers to the body of lore that is part of any genre. And it is the particular aspects of lore that are then analyzed and given meaning by a group of people, the determination to sustain that lore and to pass it down. The text is also what folklorists analyze when they're trying to understand a folk performance. Okay, let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, what I'm doing here in, in advance of sharing the theories is introducing you to a concept the, of theory that comes from uh, 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 Leanne Simpson, Landis Pedagogy, which is an, a North American indigenous concept of theory. So I'm anticipating here uh, what I'm going to talk about briefly when I get to decolonial theory. Theory in the indigenous North American way of thinking is itself a form of embodied practice it is a framework for understanding the world, for understanding how each family, community, and generation of people are embedded within a worldview. Note again that a worldview in its explanation of how individuals, family, and communities are part of a worldview is also part of a story. So theories as ways of explaining are also stories. But for indigenous peoples, they are embodied. They reflect a spiritual presence and emotion. And they are contextualized within everyday lives. So that is not typically how we think about theory in academia, but as academia moves towards decolonizing itself, it's important to understand how different groups of people think about the explanations that give meaning to their world. Next slide, please. So from a folkloristic standpoint, that is the study of folklore from an anthropological viewpoint, we explain theories as explanations that allow us to understand informal and formal cultural phenomena and how they interact. Even though I've defined two different forms of culture, informal and formal, they are not separate from each other. They are quite interactive because systems uh, that regulate human beings within societies shape when and how informal culture can be generated. I hope that will become clear as I go through this process, but here's one quick example. Burial rites, for instance, can be regarded as a form of folklore. They tell stories about life and death, what happens to the spirit, if there's a belief in the spirit, when the spirit passes on, and they embody rites of passage, transitions into the afterworld. But burial practices also are part of social organization and political decisions about what happens to bodies when they die. In other words, we have to follow the laws about the dispensation, the disposal of bodies within the context of social regulations. So informal and formal culture are always interactive. 
theories also help us to understand how different groups ascribe meaning to the folklore that they participate in and create. They allow us to create analytical folk genres. They allow us to understand the difference between description and analysis. So I can describe what happens at a burial rite, and in that description, I'm telling a story. But that is different from an analysis, which seeks to explain why these steps occur, why the burial rites take place. I also want to underscore the trap of one theoretical approach. As I mentioned earlier, um, it's really important not to just hang on to one, uh, one theory, but to draw from multiple theories. Humanity is complex, and there is rarely, if ever, one theory that will explain all of human behavior. And folklore is part of human behavior. We call those one approaches totalizing theories in postmodern theoretical frameworks, and we reject those by their claims to universality rather than their recognition of the cultural context and particularities that shape people's lives. So let's move on. What I'm sharing now is a, not a complete list of theoretical frameworks, but just some that are, I believe, most useful and which also reflect my work. Next slide, please. So structure is the first theoretical framework. All folklore has a structure, an order, a pattern of being created from beginning to end, whether it is the gathering of resources, whether it is the creation of a recipe step by step, whether it's the telling of the joke that you have to tell in a particular way for it to be funny and interpreted as funny, whether it is when a prayer is stated at a particular gathering or, or ritual practice. Within rites of passage, anthropologists have noted three particular stages, for instance, that are crucial in all rites of passage. What is particularly fascinating is that all over the world, anthropologists have noted that rites of passage include a stage of separation. That is when the individual or individuals who are undergoing the rite of passage are removed in preparation for the ritual from everyday life. They are removed psychologically. They understand they are going through a transformation and they are also can be removed physically from the everyday patterns of their lives. Liminality refers to in betwixt and in between. It's, a, it's the stage of transformation when people are suspended from their previous social roles and before they're reincorporated into their new social roles. So a liminal stage in a marriage rite of passage, for example, refers to the individuals who are not yet married they're no, they're, but they're, they're not single anymore. They're in this suspended state. And that state is often considered to be a dangerous state, a state that's fraught because the transition to reincorporation into the new social status is absolutely crucial. Therefore, during that stage, there are often sacred words customarily stated. So here I'm saying verbal lore and is customarily used during this rite of passage. I've just invoked three different genres of folklore here for you. So structure is an analysis of the component parts of folklore, how they're ordered, and why they're ordered in such a fashion. Next slide, please. I hope that as I'm speaking to you about these theories, that you're conjuring up different examples of folklore from your own everyday lives and trying to think how these theories may be useful for you in understanding the different genres that we all possess, all human beings possess folklore. One example of functionalism, because it's a broad ranging theory, it's also a theory that emerged in British um, social science during the colonial period. And for that reason, um, it is limited in its value because it tends to focus on a kind of presentism rather than the dy dynamism of folklore and culture. But nonetheless, um, I find useful Bascom's four functions or purposes of folklore. 
Folklore in stories, morality tales, for example, often teaches children caution and care. Their explanations of risk and how to avoid risk. For example, many Native American storytelling teaches children about the dangers um, that are inherent in the world. Um, and we find this actually throughout cultural folk life. A second function, um, according to Bascom, is keeping people in the folk group in line with cultural norms. Culture is, by its nature, a kind of constraining and conservative process. In order for members to be recognized, or in order for individuals to be recognized as members of a culture group, they have to conform to certain principles, to norms. Uh, although we do find, of course, in, uh, in the third function of folklore, that persons also try to escape the limits of culture. They challenge culture. Both processes are going on at the same time. Adults, for instance, are often trying to uh, urge their children to conform to rules of cultural behavior. Let's look again at marriage, for instance. Many cultures around the world have norms of marriage. These are customary practices that are also framed within the formal culture of the state that identifies laws for marriage. But in folk marriage, for example, the norms, rules, or customs of marriage may prescribe whom a person can or cannot marry, whether it's exogamous out of the group or endogamous within a particular group, ideas of race, ethnicity, religion, class, caste, all of those are features of endogamous marriage. And many people today are trying, and, and throughout history, have tried to escape the limits of culture, of these constraining rules, and that's how culture changes. They push back against it. Functionalism's fourth um, objective is also to validate folk culture, to confirm a sense of identity and belonging. All human beings are social beings that is part of the nature of being human, we are socialized and enculturated within groups. We become full adult humans within groups. We learn how to walk, to speak, to perform everyday actions within a particular cultural setting. And folk culture reinforces and creates a sense of belonging through sharing of stories, through sharing of rituals, through all of the genres of verbal lore. Please go to the next slide. Psychoanalytical theory, you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with Freud's ideas of the subconscious and the unconscious, which refers to those emotions and thoughts that are either just below our conscious level or which we are not aware of and which Freud interpreted as being um, available to be accessed through psychoanalytical processes um, that tapped into the dream world. Um, Freud also wrote about the ritual process and asserted that in rituals, many of our unconscious features are surfaced often within the liminal space. Freud identified three parts of the human personality that for healthy psychological, per psychological health, um, are integrated, the superego, which refers to the uh, idea of society's morals. And you can see here how this is linked to the functionalist theory of the sense of belonging and the constraining effects of culture that, that, that socialize people into particular groups. So the, the, the superego interacts with the ego, the concept of I, um, the personal identity and the id, taboos, desires, and fears. And it is in the realm of the id and also the liminal space where um, those unconscious or subconscious worlds are located. So when, when anthropologists are trying to understand um, how, what is being surfaced, for example, in rites of passage or rituals that involve going into trance or being taken by the spirit. They are trying to understand what is beneath the surface that is being expressed 
through the ritual process. And here again, we see other forms of genres that come into play. In many cultures of the world, the material lore of the drum is used to put persons into trance through the regulation of the heartbeat and breathing through rep repetition of rhythm. Repetition of rhythm refers to the customary lore. Sometimes chants are also accompanying the rhythm of the drum. So here we have verbal lore in the chants cus that are customarily performed through the material lore of the drums in order to surface a story about human beings ex existing in a liminal space where their subconscious fears or desires are expressed in the rite of passage. Next slide, please. Well, as you know, psychological theory emerged from early psycho psychoanalytic theory, and there are many, many theorists who are involved in this. These are really just nutshells touching the surface of these theories, but my goal here is to give you a sense in the event that one or more are particularly interesting to you and you want to delve into them as you analyze verbal folklore, which I assume is the primary form of folklore for literary analysis um, in this lyceum um, and in the literary space. But you should also not forget that when literary forms are also accompanied through customary norms and through the other genres that I've mentioned. So psychological theory recognizes that there are emotions that human beings are expected to express at certain particular points in their daily lives. So we've talked about weddings, we've talked about funerals. At weddings, for instance, the joy, the, the emotion of joy is expected to be expressed. How joy is customarily expressed varies from culture to culture. And how mourning is expressed in in, uh, in in funerary rites and in some some cultural spaces for example in irish wakes there there's often both a combination of mourning and celebration of the life of the deceased so psychological theory is interested in the expression of emotions that accompany particular folk genres it is also interested in the stages of life that human beings go through and throughout human societies. All societies have generally noted shared developmental stages. Birth, infancy, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, old age, and death. Often these correspond to changes in the body. And there are various rites of passage. There are various norms and expectations. There are various games. Games are also a form of customary lore that also involve um, uh, material lore that are played at different stages of childhood. And often those games are stories. Stories are embedded in all these forms of lore. When children are teaching other children how to play a new game, they are telling them a story. And why that game is important, why that game is played, is also calling forth another story. So folklorists are interested in identifying when they're looking at folklore, and they're looking at the genres, which particular stage of life us a genre is aimed at. And it is not only aimed at one stage of life. There are some genres of folklore, such as weddings, for instance, where all persons are involved in the ritual. Yet at the same time, the understanding of that ritual and the meaning of that ritual will vary depending on the stage of life. So folklorists would want to understand what are the stories that children might tell about a wedding? What are the stories that adolescents or adults might tell? And this varies depending upon their experiences in life. Adolescents might be preparing for marriage. Even in some societies where there's still childhood marriage and cultures are telling stories about childhood marriage, the laws in formal culture might be challenging the folk practice. What happens to the stories of folklore about child marriage when formal culture is intervening in an attempt to protect children from marriage through the law? That's just an example of how formal and informal 
culture interact. Um, and it's important for folklorists who are studying these expressions of lore to identify the different stages of life that people are involved in and what stories they're telling to one another and to each other within those stages and cultivating meaning about those various forms of folklore. Okay, um, and the, on the right-hand column, I also give an example of emotions um, and how particular genres of lore evoke particular emotions. So mothers, um, aunties, and hopefully increasingly fathers are singing lullabies to children um, when they put them to sleep. The purpose of a lullaby, it has a function. The function is to ease the child into sleep. It evokes a particular emotion of safety. So here again, I'm jumping across theories, functionalism, psychological theory, um, a stage of life in order to understand and explain the particular genre of verbal lore that is a lullaby. Next slide, please. Okay, moving into feminist theories and gender analysis. I have a number of slides in this area. It's important to observe and recognize that there are many forms of feminism and those forms of feminism um, will be useful in explaining the different genres of folklore depending on what the genre is. Yet all feminisms contain two arms, the arm of scholarship and the arm of activism. Let's take an example of ecofeminism, which has long roots in India with women forest protectors, for example. Ecofeminism might be particularly interested in understanding the role of women as forest protectors. But if, for instance, those forests are disappearing due to the, um, the, the imposition of, of corporate deforestation that is sanctioned by the state, then a feminist analysis might seek to work with the folk, with the women folk, to try to find ways to intervene to help to protect the forest. Whenever we talk about feminist theory, we're trying to understand how the folk genres can uh, uh, be understood from the perspective of the patriarchal nation, from the way there's male dominance in culture, in, in religion, and the ways in which feminism's um, arm of activism can create opportunities or portals for destabilizing dominant and inequitable gender systems. The uh, well-known Pakistani feminist scholar Fauzia Afzal Khan has argued in her study of Pakistani women singers that, quote, feminist theories of gendered spectatorship lead to resistant readings of the patriarchal nation. So oftentimes women's songs, for instance, in verbal lore are songs that are critiquing the norms, the customary lore, for instance, of marriage. The Maasai women in Kenya, for instance, um, um, participate in a cultural system of patrilineal marriage with multiple spouses, polygyny. And very young women can be married to very old men who have multiple wives. Yet those young women create songs when they're herding cattle, for instance, or doing their, other their various chores, songs that critique that kind of customary lore that they've been married into. And they sing wistfully of having lovers who, uh, who, who care for them, um, who appeal to them, and whom they have as their own um, in a story, in a romantic story of love. If we look at gender and gender systems, feminists are interested in the ways in which cultures organize the roles of men and women, um, as well as in many places, intersex individuals um, who are recognized as transgender in, in India, of course, hijras. Um, and there are many societies around the world where there are three, four, even five genders um, that have various social roles, appearances, behaviors, and expressions of emotions. So gender analysis and folklore is not 
necessarily the same as feminist analysis because it doesn't have it sometimes does, but doesn't always have um, an arm of activism to bring about transformation. It's interested in understanding and documenting and learning about the ways in which, if we look at appearance, for example, the material lore of clothing might be um, displayed um, in the performance of a third or fourth gender. So if an individual is a male-bodied individual, and performs a third gender. That third gender would appear in, per, in, in appearance of particular jewelry, for example, um, of hairstyles, and even in the movements of the body. Um, drag performance, for example, um, which are now being banned in the United States in many of the Republican states, um, are indicative of the ways in which third genders um, fourth genders challenge the hegemony of a binary gender system. They are counter hegemonic to that system. And as such, they are uh, problematic um, for those persons who want to reinforce their own story of a binary gender system. Next slide, please. Uh, let's take a little closer look here um, at some of the ways that feminist and gender analysis um, can be harnessed for empowerment against denigration. There are many stories that are told in indigenous societies around the world that tell of a time when women were in control of decision making and when things went wrong. And therefore, this is an explanation, a rationalization for patriarchal or patrilineal social organization. Men took control because women were unable to manage the complexity of social life. There are also other stories in societies that might be, for instance, matrilineal, where descent is reckoned through the mother's line and where women have significant access to decision-making um, in the political and social realms. And in those kinds of societies, which are found throughout the world, although to lesser extent than patrilineal patriarchal societies, there are stories of how men destroyed the original order of things and therefore women had to take over. So there is all kinds of ways that, um, that, that stories um, are harnessed both to explain the contemporary order of things, and that order of things may in fact reproduce a kind of denigration, um, a, a, a social inferiority um, in persons. And so uh, it, gender analysis and feminist intervention often try to identify the ways in which those stories um, marginalize and try to reproduce a proclaimed divine order and the ways in which new stories can be told in order to refute what is often um, uh, the, the, uh, an, 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 a culturally um, prescribed biological determinism. That means that social roles are explained by virtue of people's biology. Um, they are seen to be socially flowing. Um, roles are flowing from, from biological sex. Those kinds of societies tend to have very denigrating and limiting opportunities, not only for girls and women, but they also limit men, for example, in their ability to express a range of emotions um, and in their ability to participate in some customary forms of lore. So feminists um, who have conducted these gender, gender analysis often work with communities to think about ways that they can develop new stories, new rituals. In Africa, for instance, where in Southern, southern uh, 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 Sahelian Africa, where there might be practices of female genital mutilation. There are many feminist um, uh, anthropologists who are working with communities to try to change that, that, that customary practice 
that is harmful and to introduce along with local community members, new rites of passage, new rituals and new stories of empowerment that challenge denigration. Next slide, please. Okay, decolonial theory. Um, I hope that many of you are familiar with decolonial theory, um, which critiques the perceived universality of Western knowledges. I say knowledges very explicitly, because if we're going to unpack the um, assumption of the universality of any other forms of knowledge, we must do the same with quote unquote Western knowledges. Um, there is no one West. <laughs> um, in fact, the anthropologist, the late anthropologist David Graeber has written an article called There Never Was a West. Um, but when we say the West, we know what we're talking about. We're talking, it's a, it's a kind of code for um, the political imperial domination of Western societies. But that also imposes a particular time lens because we know historically other societies have also engaged in imperialism. And today there's also many expressions of imperialism and the rising fascism of many societies worldwide. So those societies, and this is formal culture, imposing different political structures um, and, and laws around education, for example, um, those they impose a kind of imperialism of knowledge that, as I say here, gobbles up other knowledges Decoloniality critiques that gobbling up, critiques that attempt to be universal, and brings an ethical responsibility to it, along with that critique of caring for all beings and for the land. Decoloniality seeks to, it, it, has, it has an activist lens to it, even within the academy, to think about far into the future, How, what are the idea systems? What are the practices? What, are the fo what is the folklore that various cultures have developed to allow accountability to one another and to all living beings? Decoloniality in folklore analysis is particularly interested in surfacing those submerged ways of thinking and being through the acts of coloniality and imperialist militarism. Feminist decoloniality challenges the overlay and interaction of patriarchal systems. So wherever there was European colonialism and beforehand in other parts of the world, for example, for, let's take for instance, Japanese imperialism, there was a form of patriarchy that was imposed um, through the imposition of colonial systems, and those shaped people's ways of thinking. For Let me give you another example for, of that. In Native North American societies, there was um, the existence of three, four, and sometimes even five genders, as I've previously noted. But with the imposition of patriarchal Christianity, those ideas were eroded those they were challenged they were undermined um, and the binary notion of gender was introduced however with the rise of the american indian movement in the 1970s that social movement activism sought to surface those belief systems and those ways of being that had embraced multiple genders in their folk world views that movement is now known as the two-spirit movement. Two spirits are persons who embody both masculine and feminine characteristics. And they have uh, begun to build greater awareness of the ways in which formal culture has sought to erase informal culture. But wherever and formal culture sought that erasure. There have been underground movements, counter hegemonic movements, where people have continued to tell their stories and express their ways of being, even if they are marginalized and not well known or widespread. So decolonial folklore seeks to surface those. Um, and we see that today, for instance, 
in powwows. Powwows are gathering of tribes across North America that come together to build a sense of unity across indigenous people's spaces where there are dance competitions and drumming competitions and beautiful costumes. It's a real rich display, a performance of all the genres of folklore. And now there are two spirit powwows. There are powwows where two spirits who have become emboldened, who have found their roots, who are free now to express themselves, are coming together to perform those dances and recreate new dances that are telling stories of worldviews that embrace a world with multiple, multiple genders um, in the historical record and also in mythology, which is another form of narrative lore. So mythologies often reinforce this um, functionalist um, constraining aspect of culture, but mythologies can also embrace new ways of looking th at things by creating new traditions that also draw on a liberatory past that has been oppressed through the imposition of formal cultural systems. Next slide, please. So as, I, as I've noted already, decoloniality is a form of reviving and reclaiming. So this is just kind of a summary of what I've said in a, in a, in a clear way, I think, um, so that you can, you can retain it. Um, how did indigenous and non-Western peoples understand, describe, and explain their worlds before settler colonial and imperialist structures? I know this is the work of decoloniality throughout um, the post-colonial world, a world that is striving still to, to uh, dismantle itself from persistent coloniality. It involves learning new ways of thinking, how do contemporary peoples around the world see themselves and understand their experiences? Decoloniality is not requesting a return to some nostalgized, lost way of being, but to find ways to integrate multiple ways of being and new ways of thinking that meet the requirements of our contemporary um, times, such as climate crisis, the environmental, glo the global environmental crisis, as mentioned earlier, the rise of fascist governments around the world, the rise of, um, of conservative regimes that reject the diversity of people in all kinds of ways. Those are, again, formal systems, formal culture that is seeking to influence folk culture. So folk decoloniality revives these ways of thinking to work with existing ideas and emerging ideas that can allow for a, a sustainable future, both culturally and environmentally. And folklorists who are involved in this decolonial process, whether it's feminist or, or not, um, ask questions such as how do we collaborate across our differences to arrive at shared pedagogical goals, processes, and curricula? How can we use our spaces of teaching and learning to build awareness of these multiple kinds of stories? Some stories that are conflicting, some stories that are seeking sustainability, stories that are seeking liberation that are through reviving and reclaiming. Next slide, please. Here are some examples now of my own work. In 2019, I was in Nepal um, for my sabbatical and I was looking at contemporary women's arts movement. I was working with both quote unquote fine artists and folk artists. Um, and in, in this example of Ragini Upadhyay Grela, who was the first woman, woman commissioner of the arts in Nepal, I want to show you how both formal and informal culture come together. That is folk culture and, author, uh, and the culture of authority um, are found in her work. Um, for part of my own methodology in building feminist decolonial partnerships is to 
build relationships, build friendships. So you can see me here, I'm eating with Ragini. Um, down below, I'm sipping wine, um, or she's sipping wine, but I'm also taking a picture and sipping wine. She's showing me her, her print workshop. She is one of the first women printmakers in Nepal. Um, and she's talking to me about um, the ideas of her art, which were to uh, bring a social and political critique to the Nepali um, um, uh, system of governance and also to worldwide gender, uh, rigid gender roles. Um, in, in Nepal, as in many places, there are stories of goddesses um, that, see, that, that emphasize um, a cherishing, a love, and a worship of goddesses. But then she would point out how in everyday life, um, women were denigrated rather than worshiped and cherished. So if we can go to the next slide, we can see how she brings together mythology, so folk culture and authoritative culture together in her painting. Here she has an image of the sacred cow, um, which is being divided and torn apart by lions who are hungry politicians, greedy politicians. They're talking on their cell phones. They're trying to grab a hold of the part of the state and the beautiful sacred cow, um, which is, as you, as, uh, as you all know, has such an important place in the folkloric imagination and in the everyday customary practices um, in, in India and in Nepal. Um, this is part of her series called the Gaijatra series from 2009, where she harnesses the sacred cow as a vehicle for critiquing politicians. So here we have the intertwining of both formal culture and informal culture, which blows apart that binary of fine art and folk art. Since folk art is drawing on, since her quote unquote fine art training is drawing on folk art ideas. We find this is true everywhere. If you look at what is known as classical culture in any society, such as Western classical music, all of those classical music pieces have their origins in folk melodies in folk dances, and they were elaborated on through the um, through the the brilliance of classical composers. There's always a relationship between formal and informal culture, and it is one of the goals of the folklorist to analyze how they come together and to draw on the various theories. Here we see a decolonial theory, we see a feminist critique because the male politicians are, look, um, here is a very, very graphic image of a male politician um, trying to suck on the udder of the cow to receive its sustenance while at the same time tearing it apart. So multiple theories are at work here. The goal of this art is to raise consciousness um, and to generate a sense of, uh, of critique that can be transformative. So again, that's a part of the feminist activist lens that Ragini brings. Next slide, please. Here we have examples from her 2011 Nature Speaks series. Um, we have on, on this one slide here with two river goddesses meeting. Um, they are meeting to discuss um, the environmental destruction um, and the pollution of rivers um, in Nepal. And on the other side, you have the, the a tree. Um, she has painted many tree families. This is the embodiment of animistic spirit in nature that is, uh, and, and polytheistic identities um, in nature, bringing nature alive, showing that nature is not just object or resource for human consumption, but again, trying to um, assert a worldview um, towards a long-term sustainable future. Again, it's bringing in these themes from folk mythology um, with a critique of the destructive um, uh, state that is um, uh, uh, threatening, threatening nature and, and all our survival. Next slide, please. In addition to 
studying with Ragini and other, again, quote unquote, fine artists. Um, I traveled south to Janakpur um, on the border with India to study a form of, mithla, of, of folk art called Mithila art. You can see me were, uh, with the women, head and shoulders. I was so much taller than, than they were. They were lovely and they invited me into their world, into their studio. I had a translator. And if you can see on the far right, um, at what you're seeing here is structure. I'm learning how Mithila paintings are created. I learned that there was the border first created and then the internal part of the drawing and then other borders around the figures. So I was learning the process of creating Mithila art. Um, and I was also interested in the themes. So if th this is a very small picture, but if on the top, um, uh, part of the, the top left from the way I'm looking at it, you can see me pointing to a painting. There was an artist in the studio who took it upon herself to insert dynamism into Mithila painting. Of course, it's always been dynamic. Uh, that is changing uh, while, this, while the form has been reproduced, but the figures are also dynamic because Mithila art tells stories. Mithila art is like the griot, the African griot, who moves from community to community, telling stories about what is important, about social roles, about changing ethics. And here in that painting, you see a blue figure. That figure is, is a policeman. And this, this painting is telling a story um, of the law against child marriage, which I referred to earlier when I spoke about marriage. Uh, and in the painting, if, if you were to, uh, hopefully this, this, the PowerPoint can be shared with, with, with folks. Um, and if you can expand that, what you'll see is a little girl who's being decorated in preparation um, for her wedding by her mother, and a policeman is coming to uh, to to enact a fine on the family. On the other side of the of the painting is a jailhouse, and so, the parents are being taken to jail. In 2015, the new constitution, formal culture of Nepal, inscribed um, laws against child marriage. Um, which still takes place because social life takes time to catch up with law when law is the first agent of change. Sometimes social life changes first and pushes formal culture to change. But in this instance, the, the constitution changed and um, folk art form is being used to educate people about this new law. And a number of NGOs working in the area um, string together in a big banner the various paintings that teach about the law and take them around the town in a newly developed customary practice um, of educating um, through movement, um, through communities. Historically, Mithila art was painted on buildings before ceremonies, uh, on houses. It was uh, painted by women. It became a form of art that men excelled at when it was commodified. There again, we have formal culture intervening on informal culture. This was women's folk art. It became masculinized when it was commodified and sold. And now um, this is the studio of, studio of Ajit Sa, a well-known Mithila artist whom I know well, who invited me to his studio, who is now retraining women who have lost the art of uh, that, that, that socialization aspect um, of Mithila art. And he is teaching it to them through a formal process, but nonetheless, it is folk art that is telling a story of a changing formal culture. Next slide, please. Um, okay, um, I, I know my time is getting, is getting I, I'm go going over time here. So just very quickly, queer folkloristics is a process that pushes the, on, the notion of queer to uh, beyond sexuality, um, beyond gender diversity, to systems that challenge uh, dominant social norms. Next slide, please. I want to close if I have time. Do I have time for to show the trailer? Uh, I created, a, I produced and directed a film in Jamaica called "Many Loves One Heart: Story of Courage and Resilience." This is a this is a film that tells stories of LGBT persons in a society um, that has laws uh, that came from 
British colonialism, criminalizing um, gay sex, um, and <laughs> and uh, I wanted to make a film that showed an emerging social movement in Jamaica challenging these colonial laws um, and uh, showing a, a pride celebration. I produced this film in 2016 during the second pride celebration ever in Jamaica. It has continued to, to occur and to grow, um, although still amidst a climate, a legal climate of, uh, that is anti-LGBT, um, but there is a folk culture that is supportive and anti-hegemonic, embracing a queer folkloristics of inclusion and diversity. So when you watch this very short, you will see all the forms of lore here. You'll see material lore and the clothing. You'll see verbal lore and the stories that are being told. You'll see customary lore in the behaviors that people describe. You'll see formal culture um, and its imposition on informal culture. Um, and um, you will see at the end, the pride celebration that is now a tradition and a very important ritual um, for this folk group in Jamaican society. You can show it now. In Jamaica, robbery is against the law. People feel that they have a right to attack. There aren't any sanctions. They know they will get away with it. People are run from their homes and communities. Homelessness and displacement is a big feature as part of the LGBT experience in Jamaica. The Bible has consistently been used by Christians to empower them in their promotion of human rights abuses. The police will, especially if they're homophobic, they will tend to pick at you, pick you up, take you to the station. Everywhere may I go, I'm scary. It's like I'm living in uh, the straight people them world. Is like when it exists. Having been a victim of discrimination myself, I thought that there was something more that I could do for my community. I've dedicated my life towards making Jamaica a better place for LGBT Jamaicans and for everybody. We also need groups like the church to come on board. It's about healthcare, it's about legal representation, it's about getting respect, having their basic human rights protected. I bleed red just like you. I feel sick just like you. I love just like you. I would love to meet somebody who make me feel women never used to get from. My mother, my father, you know, somebody who care. This is what this is about. Let me love, let me choose love. You know, I, I, I fight every day for your freedom to choose love. Give me the space to find my own love. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So you, in closing, you can see in this short clip, the material lore of pride. You can see the formal, the formal culture of the church and the state apparatus that's imposing itself. Even in the title of the film, I'm appealing to folk culture, many loves one heart. You may know Bob Marley's song, One Love, One Heart. Many loves is an appeal to the diversity of genders and sexualities um, and calling on um, a customary 
folk song. Um, it's been, of course, popularized and it's all over the world. But Jamaicans sing that song in taxi cabs. They sing it as they're humming um, and, and cleaning house. It is integrated into the verbal lore of folk society. So the, the, the material lore, the stories, these are stories that are being told um, of courage and resilience that are seeking to uh, transform the persistent coloniality in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in the creation of a new society that embraces multiple genders, harnesses activism, and ultimately uses the power of storytelling to build empathy and compassion for all human beings. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Fox, for that enriching se session. Um, I would now like to invite Dr. Madhumita Majumdar to please deliver the vote of thanks. Dr. Madhumita Majumdar is presently Associate Professor and Head of the Department of English at Diamond Harbor Women's University. She did her PhD from Jadavpur University. Her areas of interest are long 19th literature, gender studies, and eco-criticism. Ma'am, over to you. Uh, very good evening. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Diana Fox. Before we move on, Sharana, can we try once again with the link that we could not uh, uh, you know, initially access for the website and then probably move on? Yeah. So there's a link, you know, we have uh, launched a website along with this particular forum. So since we have you, we'll take the opportunity, you know, to, uh, you know, sort of uh, inaugurate this particular website. Ma'am, is it visible? No, it's not there. What I suggest, you know, take it to the present column, you know, present it. And from there, I think if you paste the link, we should be able to access it. Sharana, you can directly open uh, the uh, website from your uh, one of the Google Chrome tabs on your laptop. Right. That will do. Right, right. That will also. Yeah. Uh, Professor Fox, please bear with us for a minute. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think I got disconnected by mistake. Yeah, it's OK. Sharana, are you not able to share your screen or something? Uh, sir, I am sharing the window. Is okay. it, is it not okay. visible? No, no not yet. Uh, sir, I have yeah, shared I the window. I... Yeah, now it's visible. Now, now it's visible. It's yes. So this is our website. And in the presence of Professor Diana Fox, we formally launch it today. Yes. So this is the official uh, website and 
Sharanya, can you just link on the about us? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So that is it. Uh, Madhavadhi, please continue and deliver yes. your vote of thanks. Yes. And please take me off the screen. Now we can share this screen, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, a very uh, good evening to everyone. Um, this has been an extremely uh, delightful session. You know, thank you, Professor Diana, for that, uh, uh, you know, beginning, because the most important part of, I think, literature, you know, this is a forum where we are trying to bring together academicians, people who love literature, you know, the most important part is to be uh, telling your story, you know, to be the narratorial voice. You know, the voice is very important because the moment you start to talk, as you rightly, you know, pointed out in your talk, you know, you begin to have those perspectives. You begin to have those shreds which are unsaid or unspoken. And of course, moving beyond the gender binaries, as you rightly spoke, are these voices, you know, which have been, I wouldn't just say suppressed, but, you know, they have been largely ignored because, you know, they were not allowed to tell their stories or there were no one to tell their stories. Okay, so therefore, you know, this is, I think, the, the most beautiful beginning that the forum could have, you know, you know, giving people the power to tell their story. And of course, using the folklore and the uh, this uh, particular tradition I, I think is you know a very important because you know somewhere you know all of us in any culture react to subdued ideas you know ideas that are there in us because we keep on hearing certain things because we are given certain references you know we are told that you know people of such a binary or people with certain physical defects or anything are a people of a certain mentality you know that is there you know it's there in the indian culture so much you know and that is how we are made to react you know beginning simply with how you look beginning with like your skin color you know, you, you, you just, you, you are, you know, reacting to them or you start believing them. You don't know from where. And of course, these are our stories. And these are, of course, our folk stories, which are so deep in us and around us. And of course, you know, your work, as you say, that you moved to Nepal and to, uh, you know, India and then to Jamaica, you know, taking us to this myriad cultures where, of course, these protests were there. And I think you acted as that uh, voice which brought them out of you know their space and you know brought it to a larger forum which is you know the inclusive world that we are so rightly talking about so this inclusivity is perhaps we keep on talking about it is so difficult to be inclusive because you know uh, we don't have the right words we don't have the right uh, metaphors we don't have the right uh, uh, symbols often to express ourselves and of course this idea of uh, restructuring retelling uh, narrating and uh, constructing these tales is what perhaps we need to do. We need to start telling our stories differently. And thank you, Diana Fox, for doing that for us, opening our eyes to that and ending on that beautiful uh, short video, though you said, you know, but, you know, talking about, you know, uh, the fact that, you know, we, we don't refer to anxieties of these people, you know, the anxiety which often does not allow you to speak. Okay, so uh, thank you for that. And we hope this is just the beginning of the long association that this forum will have with you. So thank you once again, Diana Fox. I would thank the moderator of the session, Sharanna Bose, the young uh, people in this particular group, of course, keep us going. Thank you so much for conducting this event so beautifully. And of course, Lyceum is a small family for the moment to begin with. We do have, you know, a large group of, uh, you know, Facebook friends, but, you know, uh, initially this program has been sort of crafted, uh, I would say, because of, uh, you know, few people who worked relentlessly. I would, of course, thank Dr. Shora Banerjee, one of the, you know, ideators of this particular group, and of course, Dr. Shor Mila Paul, who is not here, but then the, uh, you know, she keeps on working behind the scene, pushing us uh, through these whole activities. I simply, as the senior member in this group, take the advantage of taking the vote of thanks. But then these are the people, uh, Shilpa Moitro, Dipanita Chatterjee, Sharon No, Shorobi, Sharon No, Shen, Shumona, young people, but then all enthusiasts in literature. And we hope that, you know, the journey that we begin today on the 24th of May is the beginning of 
creating a larger family of enthusiasts. And of course, you know, enthusiasts who will gain the capability, as you rightly pointed out, Professor Fox, of storytelling and narrating. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that framework um, of analysis that you brought. And I'm glad to know that my points were, <laughs> were, were absorbed. A few of 